Welcome back to our show tonight, Polygamy, What Love Is This? I am your host, Doris Hansen. And as you know, we talk about polygamy here. We go clear back to early Mormon uh, history polygamy and on forward to uh, even contemporary events regarding polygamy. This is a live show. We're broadcasting from Salt Lake City, Utah. And this is a telephone call-in program. Our telephone number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. And we do invite your phone calls, your messages, your comments, and your questions questions um, about polygamy. And if you're unable to get through on the telephone tonight regarding your comment or your question about polygamy, we do receive your comments by email. If you don't get in tonight, it, email is the way that you need to communicate with us. And our email address is tv at aboutpolygamy.com. And if you want to go back and watch any of our previous programs, you can do so in streaming video on our website, whatloveisthis.tv. And uh, on that same website, whatloveisthis.tv slash answers, you can locate uh, the top asked questions that we have on the air and uh, the answers are there. So if that's the question or comment that you have uh, that you wanted to ask us tonight, you can find it on the website and you won't need to call in. You can ask a different question. I'd like to remind those who uh, would like to attend our Life After Polygamy monthly support group. We have a, a discussion support group we meet once a month and our next group meeting is March 15th. It will be, that's a Monday evening at 6.30 p.m. And if your life has been touched by polygamy in any way, we would love to invite you to join us. We know that talking and listening to others who've gone through the same thing as you is therapeutic and it's been very helpful to many people. And uh, if you would like to attend this, this meeting, just uh, email me tv at aboutpolygamy.com and I will send you the details of the meeting. You can also log on to our website, shieldandrefuge.org, to learn more about our ministry to polygamists, to learn more about our organization, to donate to our ministry if you would like. You can do so on the web. And if you would like to find out about the resources that we have available and how to receive some of those re resources free, you can find all this out on the website. And if you're in a polygamy group and you'd like to know how we can help you, uh, our contact information is there. Uh, we also have a toll-free number. It's 877-425-9993. And we would love to help you uh, if you just have questions that that you would like to ask someone who's not going to tell you to quit thinking. Uh, we would love to talk to you. We will also help you escape. If you feel like you need to get out, uh, we'll help you do that as well. Uh, everything will be held in complete confidentiality. It's a toll-free number, 877-425-9993. Next week, our guest uh, is going to be John R. Llewellyn. He was on a few weeks ago as he talked about the, the book he wrote, Polygamy's Rape of Rachel Strong, a story of a, of a young girl's uh, problem she had in the Manti polygamy group of, uh, of James Harmston. And he's going to be on again, and we're going to be talking about other polygamy groups and a specific one that's having a lawsuit take place. Uh, he's a retired detective, a previous polygamist, and he is well-known specialist on the subject of polygamy and on polygamy groups. So we think you'll enjoy next week's show as well. I'd like to remind everyone about the Capstone Conference coming up next weekend. It's going to be on March 12th and 13th. It's going to be an excellent time of sharing and gathering information about our culture. The theme of this conference is the person, Joseph Smith, who he was, what he believed, and what he taught. There will be guest speakers from around the nation, and the conference is free, but pre-registration is required. Um, you can go to their website, capstoneconference.com, uh, to pre-register and to find out uh, more about the conference. It's going to be held at Calvary Chapel, which is located at 460 Century Drive here in Salt Lake City. Now, if you've watched um, this show very often, very many times, you should be very well aware that we dig very deeply into early Mormonism's uh, polygamous beginnings. Uh, we've talked many times about Joseph Smith and uh, being a polygamist husband of at least 34 wives. He had at least 33 wives, uh, plus his only uh, legal wife, Emma Smith. 
11 of those wives that he took were girls from 14 to 20 years old. And so, no, and that was the largest group of the age group. It was fully 30% of his known wives were uh, the teenage girls. And so it's obviously that, obvious that sexual attraction was a big part of Joseph Smith's pursuit of polygamy. Uh, we would tend to think that a man that had 34 wives uh, would be satisfied and would stop at that point and, and not go further trying to uh, get himself some more wives. But that wasn't true with Joseph Smith. He continued to uh, pursue and, um, and ask people, uh, other women, to continue to marry him. He actually proved to be, historically, to be on the prowl for women almost on a constant basis. There were women that he pursued, but they spurned him. They told him no. And, of course, he did ask some wives of friends and church leaders to uh, be connected with him as a plural wife. And uh, he proposed to some of his friends while they are away on church business. He would send them on a mission or on church business. And then while the man was away, he would proposition um, his wife. The man would come back, the husband would come back and return only to find that his beloved wife had been um, converted to polygamy and, um, and sealed to Joseph Smith both for time and for eternity. She would continue to live with her husband as her legal husband and then she and Joseph Smith would find ways to meet secretly without her husband's knowledge. All of this is documented in um, um, several of the historical books on Mormonism and on Mormon polygamy. We're not making this stuff up. Oddly enough, with some of these husbands, there were some of them who did discover that Joseph Smith had taken his wife as a plural wife, a spiritual wife behind his back, and oddly enough, they didn't cause a fuss. They seemed to mistakenly believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and so therefore anything he did must be right. But they couldn't have been more wrong in thinking that. You know, the Bible tells us many, many times that we are supposed to test. We're to test the prophets and we're supposed to test the prophecies that they make. And God has not given an exception on that. And he's also told us how to test the prophets. We are commanded to do this. That's not an option. And if you don't do it, uh, you will be judged accordingly. At any rate... Uh, these people didn't test the prophets because this is something that would never have been done by a true prophet of God. You know, people say, well, miracles and healings, and I had the feeling and I felt like it was true. That has nothing to do with it. That's never a barometer for truth. And if you want to read Revelation chapter 13, you'll find that miracles and healings are not always from God. Tonight, we are going to take a look at some of the women that Joseph Smith proposed to, but they snubbed him. And they refused the invitation to be connected to Joseph Smith in that way. Perhaps we should have called the show tonight, The Ones Who Got Away. And to help us do this, we have again as our special guest, again, Mr. True Ott. He was with us uh, last month. It's a few weeks ago. He was here to uh, share his testimony and his polygamous background, uh, his heritage, and also when he went to a, a special secret meeting with polygamists, the, the Mormon church uh, kind of caused a ruckus over that. So welcome again to the show tonight. Thank uh, you so true. much, Doris. I surely appreciate being on the show with you again. Uh, and you do a great work. And, and I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, as you, as you listen to what we're going to present to you tonight, I just uh, hope and pray that you'll not just take our word for it, but use the, the gifts God has given you, your brain and your own capacity, and research it yourself. Mm -hmm. Make sure what we're telling you is, is correct. We, we advise you to do a, a, a historical search mm -hmm. on, on this. I, I promise you, you'll be shocked and uh, dismayed about what you'll find out. I know I was. Yeah, and I like to say once I found biblical truth out, I was delightfully shocked and yes, <laughs> delightfully yes. surprised when I found out the truth uh, in the Bible. 
Uh, last time when you were here, um, I mentioned uh, there was, uh, we talked about that book. You brought it again tonight on your heritage. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we had people actually ask where they could buy your, your book on, on your background, and I just told them it was your family history. I don't think it was for sale in any bookstore. And it should be. I think it's a great book on, on Mormon history. It, it is. Got uh, a lot of historical I'm prejudiced information. a little bit. There's, yeah. a, there's a, just a, an absolute uh, treasure trove of factual information there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things, uh, mm -hmm. including uh, Joseph's, uh, uh, not, only, not only his polygamy, but his, his uh, jumping into masonry is exposed there. Mm -hmm. there's a, that's another sideline, yeah, but, it but is. it's definitely there. Yeah. And I also had some people who asked where they could find those journals of discourses for $100, too. <laughs> Golly, yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> it but, uh, was. I'd like to find one of those. Okay, Joseph Smith actually proposed uh, polygamous marriage relationships to several women who never made it into his catalog of celestial wives. And tonight we're going to be talking about a uh, well, uh, two of them, if we can get that far. Right. Uh, but among those women were Nancy Rigdon. She was the daughter of Sidney Rigdon. He had uh, proposed to her. And Sarah Pratt, we're going to talk about her tonight, William Law's wife, Jane, and Sarah Kimball, who was the wife of Hiram Kimball. Plus, Joseph Smith went to uh, John Taylor and asked him if he could have her wife, Leonora, and he went at a different time to Heber C. Kimball and asked him for his wife, Valate. And these two men actually agonized over the question and in the end told Joseph Smith he could have their wives. <laughs> And then Joseph Smith just said, oh, I don't want your wives. I was just testing, testing you to see if you would be faithful to me. And I'm here to tell you, folks, that is not from God. God absolutely does not test people uh, in that way. Uh, Satan tempts, but God does not do it that way. Anyway, let's start uh, with Sarah Pratt, Orson Pratt's wife, how Joseph Smith approached her. And uh, we're going to let um, True tell that story because he is very, he's got a good outline going on this particular story. And then we'll deal with Nancy Rigdon if we have the time. Oh, yes, Doris. Uh, Sarah, the Sarah Pratt story is really the face of, of what is wrong with polygamy. Um, in, in so many different ways. Let's just uh, uh, talk about her. Uh, in, in the year 1886, when this is a few years after, of course, the Transcontinental Railroad uh, opened up Utah to a lot of Gentile influence, we see here on the screen the, the picture of, of uh, Sarah Marinda Bates Pratt, which was, was, was her name, taken in, in the year 1879 at age 69. I don't know about you, Doris, but those people back then, when they take their pictures, they didn't look too happy. <laughs> they didn't look very happy, none, did they? <laughs> none of them looked too happy. But uh, in, in her case, she had, she, she had a, a real axe to grind. Because now that she was basically free to talk, she talked. Mm -hmm. And she did interviews. And I think there's, in the historical text, she probably did more to open up the, the world to what was really going on in, going on in Utah, which led to, a, to probably led to the 1890, 1890 Manifesto. Here on the screen we see a, uh, an artist painting of Sarah Pratt with her eight-year-old child, Marintha Althera Pratt. This was uh, right uh, in, the, in the Nauvoo era uh, when, when the, this, pit, this picture was taken. You can see here that she's quite an attractive uh, woman in many, many ways. And uh, let's just tell it the history of, of how she came into Mormonism. And, and, and she was really one of the, the chosen women, really, Orson Pratt, I, I need to remind the listeners, was one of the very first original apostles mm -hmm. of the early church. He was or, yeah. ordained as, at age 23 to be uh, an apostle, and this was in the year 1835 when he was ordained. Now, he's uh, one of, the, one of the, the most famous missionaries. Him and his brother, Parley P. Pratt, were, were legendary in mission and in, in bringing people in to, to Mormonism. One of the, his early converts was this young 19-year-old young girl named Sarah Pratt, and she was so enamored with, with Orson. He's very handsome, very articulate, very smooth, and she, she fell in love with him almost immediately. I had a whirlwind courtship. He came back through, um, asked for her hand in marriage, and they were wed and married. Uh, she was thinking this was a wonderful new, new sect, there was no such thing as polygamy ever whispered back right, then, right. and uh, she was thought it was a, a great, a great thing. 
What's amazing in her story, Doris, is think about it. They're married. They have a three-month honeymoon. Three months or three? I'm sorry. I'm three sorry. Day, three I days. Think it was. <laughs> I wish it was three months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three-day honeymoon. Thank you. And he immediately goes on and, and resumes his missionary work. Wow. What type of a, yeah. of a marriage is that? Yeah. The stars went out of her the eyes. The stars went fast. out. Of, <laughs> <laughs> and and so she she begins to to realize, oh, we I've got to uh, move back in with my family to be to have support. Uh, she she soon became pregnant, and their first child was born. It was named Orson Pratt Jr. Now, now let's stop right here. They didn't believe in supporting the families of the missionaries that no, went out. No, no, not at all. They, uh, she was to to go back and to um, live with her family to to, to for to support. Defend for herself. And, and this is an upstate New York uh, community where where she lived. So after he gets off of uh, this mission, uh, they move to Kirtland and uh, are deeply invested in the Kirtland anti-banking society of Joseph Smith, the, the Kirtland Aid Society. Now that was, and ladies and gentlemen, you need to research that si situation in Kirtland. Because I'm here to tell you from my research, there was such a, a schism created because it was, it was absolutely fraudulent. What Joseph had done was basically uh, speculate on land, the, the bank he established, he printed up his own banknotes, they turned out to be totally worthless and fraudulent. And many, many good supportive members of the church lost everything. Lots, lost the lost their and this was this affected Orson Pratt and his wife too. Uh, they lost uh, virtually all that they that they owned at the time. And were it not for the 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 group of Mormons in Missouri in far west, the chances are very good there would be no more Mormon church with this scandal in Kirtland. It was that massive. But the after the Kirtland scandal, they, they emigrated to far west Missouri, and here's, here's Sarah uh, tagging along with a, a toddler. Mm -hmm. And when, she's, when they get to far west, they have their, their second child, a girl named Lydia. Now, Lydia is, um, uh, here's a, a young child baby, and they're, they're, they're walking right into the hornet's nest now of, of the Missouri unrest. Uh, houses, farms, places of residence being burned, mobs, mobs going out. And so they, they pick up from far west, go to Commerce, Illinois, which is a, at this time is just a, a dreary swampland, mosquito infested, disease infested. And there they live in a little shack, a little shanty shack, according to her own, own story. And mm -hmm. there little baby Lydia uh, takes ill she she eventually dies, perishes, and so they, they cholera, bury her right? in a grave. Uh, after after the, the the burial, eleven days after the burial, Orson is off on a mission to England. Another mission to England. And this is now you know the 1840 early 1840 time frame. Now they they arrived the Nauvoo in 1839. Here's where the story gets gets terribly tragic. Okay, Sarah Pratt is has a young toddler. Orson Jr. She has no real means to support herself. The missionaries weren't funded. They were to go with person script, which means what, whatever people can give you uh, for charity, that's, that's what you have. And so to make her living, she did sewing. And in the 1840s, Joseph was, was busy raising uh, an armed forces called the Mormon uh, Legion, the Nauvoo Legion. And Joseph and all of the, the leaders of the Legion were, were prideful in their appearance. They wanted these fancy uniforms. Mm -hmm. They wanted the epaulets and the, the brass buttons, just like uh, you would see in, in, in the, the French Foreign Legion or, or Napoleon. Okay? So Sarah, a gifted seamstress, was doing much of this work for you know, making these uniforms. That was what she, where she got her money. Mm -hmm. And as she was doing this, of course, Joseph came to her house for fittings for his uniform, and so did uh, General John Bennett, who was the major general, while well, Joseph Smith was lieutenant general. So that's how she got intimately acquainted with John C. Bennett and, and uh, Joseph Smith, Jr. During this time period, Joseph took her aside and said, Oh, Sarah, you are to be my spiritual wife. Mm -hmm. Now... Sarah said, but I have one husband. He's away on a mission. And she, she continuously said, no, 
yeah. no thank you. Mm -hmm. And he kept on until finally she got upset after about six months of this. And she said, if you do not stop, cease and desist, I will have no option but to write my husband and tell him what's going on here and make your life miserable, basically. Um, right here, I'd like to to read what Joseph Smith said to he to her because yes. uh, he did say it to other women as well, and he said, um, "The Lord has given you to me, like she was commodity, as one of my spiritual wives. I have the blessings of Jacob granted me, as God granted holy men of old, and as of I have long looked upon you with favor. That's coveting your <laughs> That's neighbor's coveting. wife, mm -hmm. and an earnest desire of connubial bliss. I hope you will not repulse or deny me. So he just he brings in the Lord. He brings in the J blessings of Jacob, and um, and just uh, and praise propositions. Praise on her gullop. She's yeah. again. She's lonely. She's she's misses her husband, and she's. She's there trying to do what, what she can. She has friends among the women, but that's it. And here is the most powerful man, and some say he's very attractive, very charismatic. Mm -hmm. And he make, makes her to feel, you're blessed, you're yeah. honored to, to have my attraction to you. Right. And so it plays upon her, her sympathies that way as well. Uh, and. and what she actually said in later interviews is very, very telling. Uh, he, he basically came to, to the point of, if you don't do what I tell you to, I will destroy your reputation. Right. If you tell anybody that I've asked so, you So this. fear enters the picture mm -hmm. here. Fear enters the picture here. And so fast forward now to the point in which Orson comes back off his mission. And there's a there's a, a a real problem going on now with John C. Bennett. Uh, he actually had attractions to her as well, according to his book and his writings. And other uh, Mormons of the era knew about this as well. It was like they were competing for this prize, prize of all Sarah Pratt. Well, Ors Orson comes back, and and by this time. John C. Bennett has left the church. Again, keep in mind, John C. Bennett at the time was Lieutenant General of the Nauvoo Legion, Mayor of Nauvoo, and First Counselor to Joseph Smith in the First Presidency. He's not some lackey. He's, yeah. he's the second in command here. And he, by this time, has left, and he's, he's, he's stumping all across the country telling about this secret marriages of Joseph Smith. And the, the one person he can bring up as his star witness is Sarah Pratt because her chastity is intact and she's not succumbed to either his, his designs either or, <laughs> or Joseph's. And so she, she's the woman of virtue and suddenly she's right in the middle of a, of a hurricane. And Orson comes back in having no clue what's going on and suddenly he's told, look, Everybody, you know, the, the split, the camp is split. She's, she's been unfaithful to you with John Bennett. And others are saying, no, she just rebuked Joseph and this is his way of spreading rumors. So Orson is saying, oh golly, what am I going to do here? Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a picture of, 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 of Orson as a young man that, that shows his strength. Of, I mean, he's a good, handsome, good looking, uh, good person, I would think. He comes back and immediately, uh, after one-on-one -on -one with, with Sarah, he's convinced she's been faithful to him and honest. And you see his picture there. Mm -hmm. Look at his eyes. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he's a handsome, handsome man. He comes back uh, after his mission to England and takes Sarah's side totally and completely and stands up to her and uh, uh, basically verbally assaults Joseph Smith. What are you doing with this? What's going on? And he made a public statement coming out against Joseph. Mm -hmm. Well, he made, his, he made his choice, so Orson Pratt was excommunicated for daring to confront Joseph on this. Here is an apostle, ladies and gentlemen, uh, coming off a mission, uh, converting a lot of people, and because he, he dared to take his wife's side against the prophet, he's excommunicated. Now, this is what's, where it begins really interesting because he doesn't stay excommunicated long. Yeah, that's what's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> His uh, brother, Parley P. Pratt, which again is another famous figure in Mormonism, 
Parley's Canyon is named after Parley P. Pratt, mm -hmm. a really very popular uh, um, early Mormon figure. I'm sure Parley P. Pratt, Orson's brother, convinced him th that he needs to repent and get back in the fold, which he did. Mm -hmm. uh, he was rebaptized, I think, in just a few m months after his excommunication and asked the prophet's forgiveness. I just can just imagine what Sarah's feeling at this point. Uh, what has imagine. happened? And yeah. what's amazing is shortly after that, both Parley and Orson take the principle. They are now polygamous. And I, I, can, just, yeah. I can just imagine, again, Sarah's feelings. Yeah. She has no place to go. She has to stay with uh, Orson. Keep in mind that the Nauvoo is the far end of the frontier in America. She has no means, no money, no way to transport herself and her, her children and her kids. back, to, back yeah. to, to New York. So after the death of Joseph in 1844 and, and Brigham Young taking the reins, uh, she has no choice really financially but to go with the saints across the plains in 1847. She is a very, very uh, unwilling participant and a captive. And, and, and she tells her whole story in a great series of expose articles in 1886. The Salt Lake Tribune ran her stories. Uh, this, this Dr. Will, W-Y-L, wrote a book on Joseph Smith's, his, his, his friends and his family. That's the title of the book. It's a very rare book published in 1886. Sarah Pratt's entire story is chronicled there, her eyewitness testimony of what happened. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, you can get this book, believe it or not, on Oliver Cowdery's uh, Ancestors website. Uh, you can download the whole book free of charge, read it, and, and then make your own conclusion and see if you come to the same conclusion I've had. Uh, Dr. Wall is, is not, uh, I think, uh, he's just interviewing people like Sarah Pratt and Nancy Rigdon and those other stories all come to light. And Doris, we've got to, tell, we've got to say this for our listeners. The timing of all these interviews is, is quite amazing. There was, there was rumors of things going on back in you know, Washington, D.C. People, you know, the, the military were, was coming out after the Civil War. There were rumors of this atrocity of polygamy, but it wasn't until Dr. Weil interviewed William Law, who was an elderly uh, mm -hmm. gentleman, mm -hmm. uh, interviewed about his wife's relationship with Joseph, and more importantly, the in-depth interviews and written testimony in journal form of Sarah Pratt, that the whole Edmunds Tucker uh, Act, I think it, it gave them the impetus to form the Edmunds Tucker Act, the ETA. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened in 1887 with the Edmunds Tucker Act, immediately uh, Mormon attorneys challenged the constitutionality of that act, which basically said, ladies and gentlemen, that it gave the federal government the right to come in and confiscate LDS church property on the basis of an illeg the illegality of polygamy. The Supreme Court actually heard the case three years after the act passed, and so in early 1890 we see the Supreme Court ruling coming down supporting the legality of the Edmunds Tucker Act. Mm -hmm. And immediately the, the church under Wilford Woodruff, who was prophet at this time, yeah. knew they had a real problem. Mm -hmm. uh, they knew now that the church uh, could lose everything it owned property-wise, and so the manifesto, the manifesto was issued. Now, a careful reading of that manifesto shows you... It's not a revelation. It never was a revelation. It never really said, stop polygamy. It just yeah. said, we will obey the law of the land. It's a political statement mm -hmm. saying, look, we will obey this. Uh, but it never repealed polygamy. It never repealed Section right. 131, mm -hmm. Section 132. It's still in force. Right, right. Okay, uh, we have uh, reached almost the time to start taking phone calls. If you want to telephone us your questions or comments about what we've been talking about, uh, would you can call us at 801-973-8820, 801-973-TV20. Also, I would like to ask some questions regarding some of these activities of Joseph Smith to our polygamous viewers. 
uh, maybe you're an ex-polygamous viewer or a Mormon, uh, uh, an LDS church member, uh, but you're still um, uh, believe in Joseph Smith as being a prophet, I would like to ask some of these questions to you. Was it right for Joseph Smith to, wear, um, to marry 33 women outside besides Emma, 11 of them being married women living with living husbands? Was it right for him to marry 14-year-old girls? Was it right for him to continue to proposition other women like Sarah Pratt and then threaten them with uh, ruining their character when they said no if, or if they told anybody that he had uh, um, propositioned them? Was it right for him to go to, to John Taylor and Heber C. Kimball and ask them for his wives? And why aren't the women? being considered in this at all. Uh, do you think that maybe the women were just treated as sacrificial material uh, during this early Mormon history? I'd like to get some input from some of our viewers, especially those who believe in polygamy and who believe in Joseph Smith. Are these activities um, a sign of a true prophet of God and are they okay with you? Do you think that these are something you should do. So telephone us, 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820, and we will continue on. But first of all, we do have a message that we would like to show you. Speaking of leaving your polygamous situation, are you afraid to leave because you might lose the love of your friends and your family and perhaps even the love of God? Are you afraid you'll become destitute if you do leave? When I ran away from my fundamentalist upbringing and the polygamy environment I was raised in, I had no safe place to go, no place that I knew that I would be safe after I left. And I was so naive, I didn't know that I was exchanging one bad situation for another one. In those days, there were no organizations established to help people who needed to safely exit a polygamist environment. That's why a Shield and Refuge ministry exists today. We're here to help those who want to leave a polygamous situation safely and without fear. We do provide you with a safe refuge and you will be shielded from those who would harm you. So if you're thinking of leaving your polygamous situation, give us a call. We're here waiting to hear from you. Our telephone number toll free is 1-877-425-9993. If you have access to the internet, you can locate us at www.shieldandrefuge.org. And you can contact us immediately, day or night. We would love to help you. God has made a promise in Psalm 91.4 that he shall cover you with his feathers and you can take refuge under his wings. And it's his truth that will be your shield. Thank you, we um, do appreciate uh, the effort that uh, people put forward to help us with this show and uh, our guest tonight, True Ott, as he is giving information about Sarah Pratt. Uh, we have calls coming in. Uh, we still have, well, one phone line maybe uh, open. You can call us 801-973-8820. Would you uh, talk about right now um, Orson Pratt? They moved to Salt Lake and he started, he was a polygamist. He believed in it full force now. Yes. Mm -hmm. He took many wives and eventually Sarah Pratt had it up to here and she left him. Would you tell us about Again, that? Again, the timing of this is really important to, to understand. We see here on the screen Orson Pratt in his later years. He, he's not quite as handsome as he was back then because <laughs> we all age a little bit differently. But he's mm -hmm. got that fire in his eyes, you know, uh, that you see. Now, now Sarah had, uh, had, had st you know, she was kind of forced to do some things against her will. Uh, women did not have uh, the right to jump on a horse and ride back across the plains by themselves. So, when the Transcontinental Railroad, again, the Golden Spike was laid, suddenly she, she got very courageous. A lot of Gentiles were there now to help protect her and, and that. So she publicly came out against Orson Pratt, never really divorced him, but became estranged from him, separated from him, and then began to tell her story. She, she told the press, look, here's, here's, my, here's my husband, an old man now, and he's got 15 and 16-year-old uh, he married a 16-year-old girl when he was 57. Which was, right? which was younger than his youngest daughter. Right. So she said, that's enough. I, I'm not going to put up with that. Uh, it's not right. It's not just. And, and, and she became, again, 
the Doris Hansen of the 1860s. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> she she fearlessly came up and 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 told uh, what was what was in her heart. And believe it or not, a lot of a lot of women came up to her and said thank you. And and she basically made them a shield and refuge as well. So that's her story. She died. She passed on in 1888. Didn't really live to see the Edmunds Tucker Act. Didn't really live to see the manifesto, but I'm sure she was rejoicing. Her posterity, her sons from her loins, absolutely followed her her wishes, and that's a testament that's to her. That's good. Orson yeah. Jr. Mm -hmm. um, and her other sons all followed her mother, and, yeah. and were rapidly anti-polygamist, and eventually became anti-Joseph Smith, anti-Mormon because of what they knew mm -hmm. was wrong with mm -hmm. this. They knew that the fruits of polygamy. Uh, was not uh, something that, that blesses lives, but ruins women's lives. Yeah, it they does. They saw it with their mother. It does. They, yeah. they, they, I'm sure as young children, they, they came in and saw mom crying, uh, saw her broken heart. And, you know, that's got to mean something. It does. I remember that very well. I remember yeah. my mother crying, and I, I, I was too young to know why, but I wondered why she was, was having these terrible times. And we've said before on the show, and I'll say it again, they seem to think that the, the people of today, especially those in the LDS Church who defend early Mormon polygamy, seem to think that it was kind of like a romantic era, and they just did this because they were nice and benevolent to people. But the stories that, that went on in those days were more frightening, or at least as frightening, as the stories we hear today of what's going on in the local. You know, we also need to bring out the Section 132, the Revelation that uh, basically became canonized about polygamy was there was there were two parts to it doris there was the the polygamy itself but then something very sinister enters into it too and that's this emma if you do not accept it you will be you what be destroyed you'll be destroyed we, i heard it all my life you heard it all your growing life growing up that's the bet. gospel that's the doctrine ladies and yep. gentlemen of blood atonement that enters into it just like a Siamese twin with it here. Mm -hmm. So this entered into it with Sarah as well. you got to be quiet about this, Sarah, in Brigham Young's Utah. Mm -hmm. If you talk too loudly, you will go, the euphemism mm -hmm. is go over the rim of the basin. You'll be, you'll be taken mm -hmm. out and right. destroyed. Mm -hmm. And they so did it. They did it, and, and mm -hmm. she knew it. She, yeah. she knew all about this. She so, knew the rumors. So, yeah, you know, what happened to Parley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt's brother, he was, he was, you know, he, he married another man's wife in California, in San Francisco, brings her to Utah. He goes back, her husband goes back to, to, to Arkansas, and Parley P. goes with his wife to back to Arkansas to, to try and get possession of her kids, which he feels like he has a right to now. And what happens there is, is the, the estranged husband comes after Parley Purim and eventually mm -hmm. kills and, him on the again, road. And again, it's where he married another man's wife, That's just right. like Joseph Smith did. So the, the point I'm making with this is Parley P's death is, is a shock to, um, to the Mormons here in Utah. He's beloved. It's Orson's brother. He's grieving about it, I'm sure. But that led to some real anti-Gentile flames. And here's the innocent wagon train Mm -hmm. From Arkansas coming in, and, it's, and this, it was this murder that that led to the blood atonement situation of the Mount Meadows, the massacre. Mount Meadows massacre. 120. <laughs> now you think about it, 120 men, women, and children innocently massacred. How many dreams? How many uh, promises that they were looking forward to as, as their lives were snuffed out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a fruit of, it's, of, it's fruit a fruit. of polygamy. A fruit mm -hmm. and good, a bad fruit, bad root can't produce good fruit. All right, let's take some phone calls. We have on line two Hans Hans from Star Valley. Hello, Hans. Yes. Yes. Is that? Did I say your name right? Yes, you did. Okay, you're on the air. Thank you. What's your question? Uh, I guess I'm on the air. I'm just gonna. I'd like to commend you on your show. Thank you. I think it's a really nice show. Uh, I uh, want to commend you for exposing. Uh, I, I used to be LDS until I did a little research, and I figured it, wanted to figure out why everybody held this Joseph Smith in such high esteem. 
And when I did my research, I found out what a dirty lion dog he really is. And so uh, I got out of the Mormon church. Well, 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 Hans, uh, you know, you, you did kind of what I did. Uh, you, you did what Gordon B. Hinckley warned the saints about. Uh, you might study yourself right out of the church. That's basically what I did. I got to tell you, I began to really dig into the, into the, to the things that just didn't make sense. And when you really start digging and find this, the stories like this of Sarah Pratt, which, trust me, we, we're just not even touching the surface yes. here, all the oh. allegations. Just, <laughs> yeah. Some of the things we can't we can talk about on family TV, what she <laughs> what she talks about about abortions, about ins, unspeakable things here, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So Hans, thank you for calling in. Yeah. Oh, I would also like to say in uh, last week's show that uh, these Johnson boys took this guy out, uh, took Joseph out and tarted and feathered him, and they took along a doctor. Right. Now, if that doctor would have finished the job that he should have finished, it would have saved everybody a lot of misery. There would have, there would have been a lot of stories that never were here to be told, that's for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, that would have saved a lot of trouble. And he, yeah, he was... Well, you know, there's, there's a second side of polygamy, too, that I need to bring out. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a great uh, book out. You can get it at Sandra Tanner's bookstore. Uh, it's called The Sword of Laban. It's a, it's a story about... It's a, there's a, it's a medical doctor who's talking about the early life of Joseph Smith, about his his um, typhus fever infection, his bone infections, as a young man having these, these multiple surgical procedures without anesthesia would cause him to do what's called dissociation. Uh, and there's a medical term now called multiple personality disorder, disassociative identity disorder, DID. What I'm saying is with, with this, and it's, and it's clinical, Doris, these DID individuals have a, a, a extreme libido. I mean, they just cannot get enough of the opposite sex. That's part of a, a symptom of a DID personality, and it goes along. Again, the book is called The Sword of Laban. You can get it, I'm sure, at Sandra Tanner's shop. Did you have anything else that you wanted to... Well, I just to... uh, like your show, and if uh, any of the LDS people would do their research, the, the key to your show, and they'd find out that the truth will set them free. And that's what we urge them all to do is to, is to just research what we say. Just look it up because it's there. We get yeah. this information. Well, you and hang there. in there. You keep doing a good job. <laughs> well, thank you very Thanks, much. Hans. We appreciate your call. Yeah. Good night. Okay, we have Linda on line. Well, line three is not lit up, so I don't know if Linda's there. Um, we have an off-the-air question. What does it mean when a Mormon turns your name into the church as bishop? Hmm. What? Well, well. It can mean a lot of things. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, that's funny because the, the, the Mormon has a, Mormonism has a structure, and I'm sure it's the same in the polygamous communities. They really kind of watch out for each other, but it's to the point of, of sp almost spying on each other. They, they watch and see what goes on in the neighborhood. It's neighborhood watch times Yeah, 20, yeah, okay? it is, it is. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, spy uh, on each other. When they turn your name into the bishop, it may be because they think you could be leadership material and get a, a new calling. <laughs> <laughs> Let's think positively on that one. <laughs> Maybe but, it's to pray for you. Too. Yes. We don't know. We don't know what that might be. <laughs> Usually it's not a good thing that you need to call, be called into repentance, though. Yeah. Okay, we have an off-the-air uh, question. Would the, shield and <clears throat> would the shield and refuge help someone who's harassed by members of the church? Um, we help those who are needing um, questions and problems and exits out of polygamy groups. But if you are having some harassment by the church, we can talk to you and certainly get you to someone who will help you with that. You betcha. We'd love to do that. So if you want to um, email us tv at aboutpolygamy.com or call back in and leave your name and telephone number with the operator uh, indicating that, that this is why you're calling back, uh, we can give you a call and we can get you some help. You bet we'll do everything we can to help you. There's a, there's a lot of harassment going on today. Too. Oh, I, I hear, mean, yeah, I hear uh, a lot of it. The, the Internet is a, is a great tool these days to, to get the <coughs> truth out. The uh, website irr.org. Mm -hmm, that's a good uh, one. That's a great one because they have they have the the 1835 doctrine and covenants and show the the, the myriad of, of changes made with you know the modern DNC 
important information going out. Mm -hmm. Good information too. If they just would check it out, that's right. There, there's no, but you know, it just goes. Uh, I hear it all the time. I, I know Sean McCraney hears it on his show um, all the time, and I'm sure that we all hear it. I'm a Mormon, or I believe in Joseph Smith. I don't need to check it out because I know. Right. And they don't. Uh, that's that's tell it to God because He's not going to buy that. Well, I, you know, I, uh, Thomas Edison, one of my one of my heroes, he said it best when talking about faith. He said, "You got to make sure your faith is rooted in fact, in in truth," because he said, "quote Faith in fiction is a damnably false hope." You know, there's a lot of people that say that faith is the most important thing. It is not. The object of your faith is what's important. Right. And if you have your object in something that's not worthy. Make sure it's, it's based nuts. on truth, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. not a fiction. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's our message. That's Absolutely. my message. That's right. Yeah. Okay, another off-the-air question. Um, Brent from Clearfield, how do Mormons today explain post-manifesto polygamy? Well, again, we, we talk, touched on this. The manifesto didn't really outlaw polygamy. It just basically, again, go to the, go to the Internet. You can search it up. Say uh, Wilford Wood Wilford Woodruff manifesto polygamy. You'll get the entire text of his manifesto. It was merely we will obey the law. That's the whole text of it, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it, it it was targeting polygamy, but it didn't really say polygamy is wrong or right. And uh, what I hear a lot of the Mormons saying is, we don't believe it anymore because it's illegal. Uh, we don't live polygamy. It's, we quit that way a long time ago, and we only did it for a time, and then the time for that is over. But, you know, it was always illegal. It was never a time when it wasn't illegal. And so that reasoning is, uh, is just a smokescreen, or, or perhaps from people who really haven't done their research and don't know that it was always very, illegal. Very good point, Doris. The, the Edmunds-Tucker Act basically just gave teeth to the federal marshals mm -hmm. to yeah. come in and basically have penalties associated with it. It was always illegal. Yes. But now they have penalties associated with it. That really means something disenfranchise the property. By the way, you know, true churches really don't have a lot of property to worry about. They shouldn't. <laughs> but, but if they're well. into building wealth and building up a kingdom, yes. that's a problem. Yes. They, and Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, so I don't know what they're doing with this that's world right. stuff. Okay, line three, Billy Joe. Hello, Billy Joe. Hi. Hello, you're on the air. Uh-huh. Yeah, you need to turn your TV down. I sure did. Um, I just have a question. First of, okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. I just have a question. Um, first of all, I didn't know Joseph Smith was married 30, 34 times. Uh huh. At least. And that eleven of them were already married. Is uh -huh. that correct? Yes. Living with their husbands while he married them. Yes. Right. So that's basically adultery, right? Basically. <laughs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> and see, and, and well, um, well, I was just wondering. Okay, Solomon, Solomon had many concubines and many, many wives. Right. But yet God used him. Could this be possible with Joseph Smith also? Well, how did God use Solomon? Uh, after he, uh, um, chapter eleven of Second Kings, we read that. Um, Solomon had the 1,000 wives, 700 wives and 300 concubines. And at that point, God was very displeased with him. And you won't find after that chapter that he used Solomon. And that's a good point. Oh. Not only that, but okay. the, the, the temple became a, a place of debauchery and became a cursing. It wasn't, uh, you know, Solomon began very well, but he, his decline and his fall was just as rapid. If you really read the Old Testament under, and understand it, and on top of that, Billy Joe, in Deuteronomy 17, 17, the Bible, God gave command to the king. The king was not to multiply wives to himself. So we find that Solomon also made some bad choices. Wow, well, I appreciate that information. So that was Deuteronomy 17, 17. Yes. Okay, and then also, um, oh, what was I going to say? <laughs> Sorry. Um, what what do you need to do? Okay, I know you pray and you ask God if someone is a true prophet, but how do you find out the signs? Because I'm still learning. Read Deuteronomy chapter 13, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, um, 
in 1 John chapter 4, God says, test the spirits, and because not all of the spirits are from God. And what, they, what you have to do is test the message to see if the message that they give lines up exactly with what the Bible teaches. And if it goes off one way or the other, you've got the wrong message and the wrong prophet. It has to line up exactly. And, and, and just, just one false prophecy negates him right. being a prophet. Mm -hmm. Just one. It's just like if you're a, a complete, perfect truth teller, if you tell one lie, you're no longer a truth teller. Right. You are a liar. Right. Okay. So that's, uh, that's the key to tell about a, a true prophet as well. Okay. Well, I sure appreciate you answering those questions. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks. for calling. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm, bye. Off the air question, are the Pratts they are talking about part of the reorganized U LDS or Utah LDS? There was a Utah LDS church. This was well before the reorganized was even thought about. Um, it, 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 they were here in Utah. Orson Pratt is, uh, is, is in the icons of, of, of Mormonism. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was just telling off the air uh, to, to Doris that because of, of, this, of his lineage of, of time into the apostleship, if he hadn't been excommunicated for those two months, he would have been prophet uh, before his death. So he lost his seniority <laughs> position for two months. He had to start over again. Oh, dear. That's too bad, isn't it? <laughs> too Line bad. two, Nick from Midvale. Hello, Nick. Yes. Yes, you're on the air, Nick. Great. I uh, appreciated the great show. Thank you. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, my question is has to do with uh, Mitt Romney and his potential of uh, being uh, president of the United States. Now, I... I know that uh, that the Mormon Church uh, believes that all of Christianity is, a, is an abomination and that you uh, actually need to be uh, faithful to the Mormon Church to, uh, to acquire heaven. Now, I know that's not exactly what you're talking about tonight, but I, uh, I'd like to, like to hear your opinion on that and what that would bring, what you think it would bring to the country, uh, seeing... Uh, Mitt Romney is, is president of the United States. So I'd like to hang up and listen. Well, thank you. That's a great question, and I and I, I I've actually put a DVD together on this very subject. Because because make no mistake, Mitt is going to be the uh, golden boy uh, in 2012. Mitt Romney comes from the polygamist group in Mexico. Uh, that's that's his that's his heritage. I mean, just a a, a grandfather away. I mean. The, the, mm -hmm. the Mormon uh, uh, myth, mythology, is that if the Constitution is ever going to be saved, uh, a priesthood holder will have to do it. And I'm sure that Mitt Romney feels like this is his calling and his, his, uh, his uh, uh, destiny to perform that. But that given, what is the, what is the organiza organizational structure behind Mitt Romney? I, I de delve into that deeply in a, in a DVD I presented. It's not very popular, but I look at his, his history. Uh, the bloodlines of, of that, the, the, the uh, genealogical history uh, library uh, back in 2002, Doris, had the whole, uh, a whole wall filled of the descendants of Anne Hutchinson. And all the way down from Anne Hutchinson's line, you see down here, Mitt Romney is gloriously portrayed as the man. Mm -hmm. This is back in 2002. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that was... Boy, golly, you know, who was, yeah. who was Ann Hutchinson? All of this is explained in my, in my presentation DVD. Ann Hutchinson is the patron mother goddess of Salem witchcraft. You go back to the oh. witchcraft museum <laughs> and you see, Salem, you see Ann Hutchinson there in a wax figure. In the, in, the, in the witchcraft museum. What is okay. that about? What is I don't, that about? I don't have any idea. <laughs> Let's go to <laughs> line one. Dan from Ogden. Hello, Dan. Yes. Yes, you're on the air, Dan. What's your question? Hi. Great show. Thank you. Uh, I come from a, a long line of uh, early settlers here in Ogden, the first, uh, you know, one of the first ones here that uh, created Ogden. And so I know a lot about the polygamy and uh, stories in my family. But I have a question. Uh, I have a, a young friend, beautiful young woman, who lived in Brigham City. And uh, her husband was in Iraq. And she was struggling with two little girls. And an elderly man uh, approached her, and I, I was 
I was there and met him, and he was constantly coming over. And uh, and my friend told me that he was uh, asking her to become his spiritual wife. Wow. And he was he had was married. He was you know uh, could be her grandfather, and uh, he was constantly trying to get her into the fold of wives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on a spiritual sense and that he would take care of of her and she would never have to worry and to me that sounds like that if she would do that that he would feel like he had liberty and it could be a oh i'm sure i'm sure i i would do you have any thoughts on that if if, yeah if you find out who that is i'd like you to tell me (laughs) i'd like to follow through on see what's going on with that but i'm sure he he demanded secrecy oh yeah you bet he'd take he'd try and take liberties absolutely yeah in fact my uh Mm -hmm. my neighbor uh moved in he was his best friend and he's a young Mm -hmm. man yeah and i i he comes from uh the snowville area which is Mm -hmm. uh uh, border of Idaho, Utah. And I think that's a little notorious. Yeah. Anyway, but, yeah, there are, uh, there are several polygamists yeah, in that he, area. He was familiar with this. And mm-hmm. I've heard that story of spiritual wives probably all my life. And I'm I'm in my 60s mm-hmm. and born and raised here, like I say, the, the Browns, uh, which, by the way, with the gentleman that's sitting there, in my heritage, there's an Orson Pratt Brown. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's Probably to just a namesake. <laughs> At least a namesake. Well, like, well, not, but that's a big, big family who, who went down into uh, uh, Mexico, I think. But mm-hmm. A lot of them went down event, there. Uh, uh, is there any concern on this spiritual polygamy? Well, that's what polygamy is, a spiritual wifeism. Um, and they just call it that. There, there's a lot of different names for it. We're, and uh, right now we are closing down the show. It's getting close to the end, and so we need to hang up and and uh, say our closing comments. But Dan, thank you. And if you want to email us, tv at aboutpolygamy.com with more information, um, I'd love to hear from you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh Good night. Okay, Cindy and Stan from St. George, we won't be able to take your call. If you want to uh, leave some contact information, perhaps I can call you back or email you. And Alan from Logan has an off-the-air question. When missionaries go to mission to England, do they practice polygamy there? Not that I've heard of. No. Um, I, it's, it's just if a question. If they try to, they'll be excommunicated. Yeah, <laughs> they will. <laughs> okay. Um, on the closing comments, I would just like to say that I hope polygamy, uh, the polygamists that watch the show everywhere will understand that God is not the author of polygamy. He hasn't asked you to practice polygamy. Uh, it's, uh, he doesn't say, thou shalt not commit adultery and then turn around and tell Joseph Smith that he can take all of these wives and ask for the hand of the wives of his counselors. Uh, you must do what we all do, and that's ask God for forgiveness. Thank you for watching our show tonight. <laughs>